Hello and welcome. Uh, we will wait a few more minutes as, as people continue to join and start at 12.02. Thank you all for joining us today. Gunas Chish. My name is Aaron Brakel. I'm the Clean Water Campaigns Manager for the Southeast Alaska Conservation Council. Yake Hati Adi. It's good that you have come. I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. I'm calling in from Ak Kwan lands on Tlingit Ani, known as Juneau, Alaska. We ask that you take this moment to recognize, acknowledge, and thank the traditional and current indigenous stewards of the land you are on and call home here in Alaska and across the continent. We lift up and affirm the connection and stewardship of the people whose unceded homelands we are on and the importance of their relationships with and knowledge of the land, water, and living things in the places that we live. We offer our gratitude for their protection and continued stewardship of these lands. Today's webinar is titled End Scrubber Use Now, a simple solution to Alaska ocean pollution. I want to thank our co-hosts, Pacific Environment, the Southeast Alaska Conservation Council and Alaska Community Action on Toxics for their support in putting this webinar together. Our objective today is to inform people about the use of exhaust gas scrubbers in Alaska, how this situation recently came about, some of the risks of exhaust gas scrubbers, um, uh, and what, uh, what the recent scientific evidence about scrubber discharge is telling us. And we want to share with you some of the values and communities that are put at risk through the use of scrubbers. And of course, we want to talk about the simple solution to this problem. Our speaker, um, our presentation will begin with some introductory remarks from me, followed by a video introduction to scrubbers from Elise Stirrup from the International Council on Clean Transportation. This will be followed by a panel of Alaskans, including Jim Gamble from Pacific Environment, Cynthia Peterson, President of the Akatat Tlingit tribe, and Vivian Mork, an educator and harvester of traditional foods and medicines, as well as Eric Jordan, a lifelong salmon troller and conservationists. We'll also take some, uh, share some actions that you can take to push for an end to scrubber pollution. If you have questions, please put them in the Zoom Q&A at any time and indicate which speaker your question is addressed to. We will be addressing questions as time permits after all the panelists have spoken. So the basic problem with exhaust scrubbers here in Alaska is that cruise ships visiting Alaska are taking our clean living seawater 
and spraying it through the hot, highly acidic exhaust filled with toxins and killing the living things in the water, as well as creating a large volume toxic waste stream that is dumped into the waters that we rely on for healthy food and for our economy. This is fundamentally irresponsible, and it goes against our stewardship responsibility to love and protect this place. It's a terrible idea, and there's an easy fix. Burn cleaner fuel. Last year, I had a couple of conversations that were really important to me in focusing my attention on this problem. One with the state regulator and another with the tribal cultural resources director. And what came clear from those is that no one was taking a hard look at what's happening here in Alaska with scrubbers and that Alaska doesn't have the regulatory framework currently to prohibit this discharge. These conversations prompted a deeper dive and what I began to understand is that this is a new source of pollution. It is now the largest source of water pollution from vessels in Alaska, and that studies in other parts of the world are showing serious problems with scrubber discharge. There is a growing international movement and the bans on and restrictions on scrubbers are increasing around the world. I also found that there are very good partners who are already focusing on scrubbers at the region, regional and international level. At SEAC, our focus is here in Alaska. What we do in Alaska makes a difference, not only to the lands and waters here, but also through example on a global scale. What we do, what we Alaskans do makes a difference. So how do we get here? In 2015, a cleaner fuel standard came into full effect in Alaska, but there was a loophole that allowed the use of, the, of these exhaust scrubbers. Almost all of the ships with 1,000 or more passengers that visit Alaska have scrubbers, and two-thirds of those scrubbers are the open loop. In 2023, two-thirds of those scrubbers were of the open loop variety with a continuous discharge into, into waters while they were operating. That discharge is hundreds to thousands of cubic meters every hour from each ship. In fact, in a 2022 study in Canadian waters, a single generator and scrubber unit combination produced 2,500 cubic meters of scrubber wastewater every hour. That is an Olympic size swimming pool every hour. Large ships can have up to six of these generators for propulsion and electricity. This is living seawater, full of life, full of marine organisms, fish, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and marine invertebrates. In these open loop systems, this seawater is taken aboard and pumped up into the exhaust stack at a high energy cost and sprayed through the exhaust from burning the dirty heavy fuel oil. This dirty exhaust is hot, it's highly acidic, and it's full of toxic pollutants, including sulfur, heavy metals, soot, oil, nitrates, nitrites, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Living seawater sprayed through the contaminated exhaust and dumped out into the places we get our food. How can this be okay? Something else I learned is that the scientific due diligence on the impacts of scrubber discharge was never undertaken before this discharge was allowed. Remember, these decisions were made in London at the International Maritime Organization and agreed to and put into place in Washington, DC. As Jim Gamble from Pacific Environment will share with you, the recent science has shown that there are serious impacts from scrubber discharges. There is unknown damage currently being done to the environment for small gains for industry. These are the waters that we eat from. Our social, economic, cultural, and spiritual health are tied to the health of these waters and to having a respectful and respect reciprocal relationship with them. There is a lot that is put at risk when corporations callously pollute the environment 
just because someone told them that they could do it doesn't mean that it's an okay thing to do. I'm going to share now a video from Elise Sturup. Uh, Elise is a researcher with the International Council on Clean Transportation's Marine Program. Elise could not join us in person today, so we'll view this brief recording. Oh, it could use a little help. Uh, let's see. There we go. Oh, there we go. Hello, my name is Elise Strupp. I am a researcher with the International Council on Clean Transportation, or ICCT. My focus in research is on Uh, Aaron, I don't hear uh, Elise. I think when you muted, you might have muted the audio. I restart the video. Uh, thank you, Jim. Hello, my name is Elise Strupp. I am a researcher with the International Council on Clean Transportation, or ICCT. My focus in research is alternative fuels and efficiency technologies. I study what are the pathways shipping can take to decarbonize completely by 2050. I'm sorry I could not attend the webinar today, uh, but I hope I can help out by further explaining exhaust gas cleaning systems or scrubbers. Scrubbers are devices installed on ships to reduce harmful air pollutants like sulfur dioxide from fuel emissions. It sounds like a good idea, right? Well, in actual practice, scrubbers essentially trade air pollution for water pollution in many instances. Scrubbers have been used for a long time in coal power plants. The basic concept is spraying an alkaline or basic solution onto outgoing exhaust so that the alkaline solution absorbs the sulfur pollutants. When the IMO put in place the global sulfur cap in 2020, it limited the allowable amount of sulfur able to be used in all maritime fuels. A loophole was allowed, though. Ships could continue to burn the cheaper, higher sulfur fuels if they had scrubbers installed that would limit sulfur emissions coming out of the exhaust. Thus, installation of scrubbers on ships have skyrocketed. DNV estimates over 5,000 ships will have scrubbers by 2025. Not all scrubbers are the same either. There are three types, open loop, closed loop, and hybrid. These loops refer to the sourcing and depositing of the alkaline solution. The open loop scrubbers are the most prevalent with 80% of installations being open loop. Their alkaline solution is seawater and for open loops that what goes in must come out. An open loop scrubber will suck in seawater, spray it into the ship's exhaust, then discharge the wash water back into the ocean. Many open loop ship schematics will show a filtering step before discharging. However, based on surveys, these filters don't seem to be effective based on the high flow rate. It needs to take in the seawater to spray and then to discharge. Essentially, whatever was combusted and intended for the air pollution is transformed into water pollution. Closed loop scrubbers aren't the solution either. Though they're not discharging the large volumes of wastewater like their open loop counterparts, uh, they do discharge highly concentrated bleed off. Closed loop and hybrid scrubbers, which can alternate between open and closed modes, have the capacity to operate in zero discharge mode, but would need to store the sludge produced by the scrubbers and be properly disposed at at port, which is not a common facility. Scrubbers are an unfortunate direction for the shipping industry. They have introduced a new source of water pollution in the recent years, to areas already congested with ship traffic. An ICCT report shows that all scrubbers contribute to water pollution and emit nitrates, PAHs, and heavy metals. The wash water is also acidic and turbid, contributing to ocean acidification. The amount of pollution that is discharged, as well as its ecological impacts, depend on the waters the ship is in. Ports are often near freshwater sources like rivers, which can affect the salinity and therefore the alkalinity the seawater being sprayed on the exhaust. 
While scrubbers are an effective tool at absorbing and neutralizing sulfur dioxides, as their intended purpose is, sulfur dioxide is not the only pollutant being emitted into the air for a ship burning heavy sulfur fuels. According to an ICCP report, if you compare a ship burning heavy sulfur fuel with an installed scrubber to that of one burning cleaner compliant marine gas oil, the ship with scrubbers will emit more carbon dioxide, particulate matter, and black carbon. So even as air pollution solutions, it is not effective for any other pollutants. As scrubbers increased in prevalence in the last five years, there have been several countries and port authorities banning scrubbers in their waters to eliminate the source of water pollution. ICCT reviewed national, regional, and local bans on scrubbers last year and found 93 bans and restrictions in place against scrubbers and associated discharges from across the world. Some are more stringent than others, and many bans focus on open loop scrubbers given their large volumes of discharges. Noble bans are the Port of Singapore, which is the world's largest refueling hub for ships, the Panama Canal, and the state of California. One region I'd like to highlight is Alaska, because it was exposed to early scrubber uptake and started raising the first alarm on scrubbers. Before the IMO 2020 global sulfur cap, there are regional sulfur regulations. One of these is the North American Emission Control Area, or ECA, which Alaska is within, which limited the amount of sulfur and fuel in these areas in 2012, eight years before the global sulfur cap. This meant ships that operated often in the North American ECA had to comply with regulations earlier. Operating between Seattle and Alaska, cruise ships were early adopters of the scrubber technology, thus were seen in Alaskan waters earlier than other regions. In 2017, the Ocean Rangers Program, a group of private environmental compliance officers who oversaw Alaska's cruise impacts at ports, began to report on scrubbers. They reported and photographed oily sheens on the water and discoloration, and they were able to confirm the pollution point source was from the scrubber outputs from the ships. Fortunately, the Ocean Rangers Program was defunded in 2019 and discontinued, but thanks to those initial Alaskan reports, when the global sulfur cap began in 2020, and we saw that uptick in scrubbers everywhere, the seed of doubt of this alternative compliance tool was in place. Scrubbers, while initially touted as a solution to air pollution, have proven to be a double-edged sword. By trading air pollution for water pollution, they introduced a new set of environmental challenges. To address these issues, a more comprehensive approach is needed. This can include more bans at a regional or national level, investment and development of alternative fuels such as marine gas oil, hydrogen, and battery electric to reduce the need of scrubbers, and then enhance monitoring, implementing monitoring programs to track you know, the impacts of scrubber discharge and inform policy decisions. By taking these steps, the maritime industry can work towards a more sustainable and environmentally responsible future where the scrubber loophole can close and we can eliminate a point source of water pollution. Thank you for listening today and I hope you learned something new. Thank you to uh, Elise uh, Stirrup and the International Council on Clean Transportation team. Uh, we'll next hear from Jim Gamble Jim Gamble is the Senior Director for the Arctic Program at Pacific Environment. Thanks very much, Aaron. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, as Aaron said, I'm Jim Gamble. Uh, I was born and raised here on Denina lands in Anchorage, Alaska. And I've been working on uh, Arctic marine issues for nearly 20 years. What I'd really like to talk to you about today and, and make sure you come away with is that um, recently, Pacific Environment um, uh, released a study that takes into account a vast body of data, uh, including new, stu new studies and new data that um, um, address scrubber discharge and what the dangers of it are. Um, this slide uh, has a URL, a URL that you can use to uh, find the report online. But I also want to emphasize, just ask any of us um, if you have trouble with it uh, and can't find it for whatever reason, we really want you to have access to it. So um, um, I'd urge you to take a look at the study. A lot of what I'm going to talk about for the next couple of minutes 
uh, you can find there in much greater detail. And, uh, and so uh, I think it's quite worthwhile. Um, Aaron, next slide, please. So what in, in summarizing the study's findings, I think uh, uh, an important thing to come away with is this, and that is that scrubber pollution is toxic, toxic to marine life in very low concentrations. Um, one of the things we talk about when we're talking about discharge of any pollutant is how it's diluted. And, and there's this idea that if you dilute this discharge enough, it becomes not dangerous. And, and unfortunately, um, that's not really the case. Um, what we're finding is that even at very, very low concentrations, this discharge is quite dangerous. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. So to kind of summarize a little bit of this, um, what we're seeing, as Elise pointed out, are things like PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, nitrates and nitrites, and a number of heavy metals, including nickel, lead, copper, and mercury. This can vary sort of depending on the makeup of the fuel, you know, where the fuel came from, what crude oil it originally originated from. Um, there can be some variability here. But um, all of these things are present um, in virtually all scrubber discharge. And what we found um, uh, within the body of research that's been done is that concentrations as low as 0 0.0001 cause significant malformations of larvae of sea urchins, mussels, and uh, polychaete worms. Um, in addition, things like corpopods and marine invertebrates and microplankton also suffer negative effects um, throughout their life cycle. And these uh, creatures are really important because they serve as the basis of the food chain for virtually everything above. And so even um, uh, species such as the, uh, the southern resident killer whales uh, in, ca in Canada's southern seas, they are affected by this because elements of their food chain are affected by this, not to mention how they might be directly affected by the scrubber discharge. Um, just thinking about human health imp impacts, um, these toxic pollutants have been documented to cause cancer, uh, affect neurological development in children uh, and lead to a whole host of debilitating impacts on human health. I, I think another thing uh, to keep in mind is that we really don't know exactly all of the compounds that are being discharged in scrubber water because it's difficult to take into account things like how different PAHs react together or how they react with different metals at different concentrations. And, and so it's really difficult at some levels to talk about or discover all of the effects that we might find because we simply don't know all of the compounds that are being produced by this mixing. Um, beyond that as well, the testing protocol that was developed by the International Maritime Organization in order to assess uh, scrubber discharge relies really heavily on pH, or in other words, the acidity of the, of the discharge that's coming uh, uh, into the water. And the US um, adopted this testing protocol as well. So this overemphasis on pH um, really results in missing a lot of potential impacts uh, of the scrubber discharge. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. So as Elise mentioned, the number of ships using scrubber systems has climbed dramatically, um, uh, especially uh, as the, uh, the cap on sulfur in, in heavy fuel oil uh, was coming into effect in 2020. And so you can see um, this, uh, this rise was, was quite, uh, quite dramatic. Um, as Elise also mentioned, um, vessels using scrubbers are continuing to rise. And, and in fact, we're seeing vessel types that traditionally haven't used scrubbers, such as container vessels, begin to use them. And the idea being that uh, installation of a scrubber can pay for itself in relatively short time because of the difference in price between cleaner fuels and dirtier fuels. Um, and um, this increase, again, is continuing. Uh, next slide, Aaron. But what we're also seeing, uh, as Elise mentioned, is a number of bans and restrictions that have gone into effect. Uh, and this number is also growing. This is directly related to the evidence we're finding about um, um, how dangerous scrubber discharge is, what its effects are on the ecosystem and on human health. And this map gives you an idea of the state of bans and restrictions in 2023. Since then, there have been a number of additional bans, including bans, uh, Arctic bans, for uh, Denmark uh, and Sweden, and uh, uh, cons bans are being considered by other Arctic countries as well. 
Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. So what's the solution to all this? Well, as, uh, as has been mentioned a few times, the solution is to burn cleaner fuel. And when we're talking about scrubbers, uh, we're making kind of a very simple request because we're asking ships to burn lower sulfur heavy fuel oil. Uh, lower sulfur heavy fuel lower sulfur heavy fuel oil is a very dirty fuel. Um, and uh, in reality, what we need to do is get away from heavy fuel oil altogether. But for the for the for the near term, um, burning cleaner fuels, will uh, get rid of the need for scrubbers um, and it will eliminate discharge. And in the near term, that is a very, very um, good goal and one we should be pursuing. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, I was, I'm not sure if I was muted there. Um, thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, really appreciate Pacific Environment's work and, and being able to work with you all. Uh, next, we'll hear from Cynthia Peterson, uh, who is the President and Interim Executive Director of Yakutak Klingit Tribe. My given name is Shawat Watts. My Klingit. That's my Tlingit name. My English name is Cynthia Peterson, and I am from the Gilhiyak Kaguantan Eagle Beaver Clan of Yakutat. I am calling in from the Yakutat lands um, on Yakutat Ani. I am the tribal president of the Yakutat Tlingit tribe, and I am also the interim executive director of the Yakutat Tlingit tribe. Before you, we have the presentation um, prepared by the Acta Clinket Tribe. It's the Cruise Ship Impacts in Disenchantment Bay. Next slide, please. The impacts of scrubbers on our marine environment. The Acta Clinket Tribe is deeply concerned about the impacts of cruise ships on our waters and marine ecosystems. Scrubbers emit harmful discharges that pose significant risks to fragile ecosystems and the health of our people. Scientific studies have demonstrated that scrubber emissions have adverse effects on marine organisms critical to our food web. Next slide. The cruise ship traffic is increasing dramatically, as you can see um, for the graph below. This is the um, cruise ships that have entered into Disenchantment Bay by year. Um, and it has significantly increased since 2016. And if we had the data for 2014 and, or 2024 included in this as well, it, you would see a dramatic increase um, from 2023 as well. Next slide. In response, YTT has passed a resolution 2024.06.26-8 a formal stance on cruise ship vessel emissions and environmental impact on Yakta ancestral waters. YTT asks the cruise industry to switch to cleaner fuel while transversing Yakutat Bay to Disenchantment Bay and to not use scrubbers while in the Yakutat Clinket Tribe territorial waters. YTT is committed to safeguarding the future of Yakta ancestral waters and to ensure the continued vitality of our ecosystem for the benefit of present and future generations. Next slide. YTT is concerned about cruise ship and service ship proximity to seal pupping, act seal pupping activities and areas in the months of May and June. Cruise ships and Allen, Allen Marine service vessel, the St. Theodosius, are not following NOAA's guidelines for maintaining distance from seal pupping areas. Mom and baby seals must be harassment free during pupping so that seal pups can survive to adulthood. Seal protein is very important to the diet of the Yakutat Clinket peoples. A thriving seal population is critical to our way of life. Next slide. NOAA's guidelines restrict travel to near the Eastern shoreline and more than 1.5 miles from the Hubbard Glacier during the pumping, 
during the puppies pupping seasons. As you can see in the graph, it shows the approach guidelines for tidewater glacial fjords, um, which is what we're discussing right now. Um, the restrict travel to the eastern half of the bay within one to one and a half miles of the shoreline and more than one and a half miles from the Hubbard Glacier during the pupping season, which is May 15th to June 30th. Vessels routine routinely violate this recommendation every single year. Cruise lines tell passengers that they'll get within a half a mile of the glaciers. A lot of this can be documented on social media. There are um, several places where you can just type in Hubbard Glacier and you'll see several cruise ships within a mile of the Hubbard Glacier. Next slide. NOAA recommends go, no go, and recommended travel zones during the pupping season, May 15th to June 30th. And you can see on the picture there where the travel no go zone is, the glacier no go zone is, and the recommended travel and viewing area. Next slide. The St. Theodosius, which is an Allen Marine vessel that accommodates cruise ship passengers um, and all other passenger vessel presence in the glacier no-go no -go zone during pupping season. And this is from 2019 to 2023. And you can see in the, <clears throat> the graph in, <clears throat> excuse me, that the other passenger vessels in 2019 was, um, was pretty high and it's gone down each year. But you can see the St. Theodosius um, track record and how it's increasing each and every year. We are water people. The health of our waters is very important to us. Our favorite recreational time is in our ocean, on our rivers, on our lakes, keeping them healthy is keeping us healthy. The next slide is for questions and Gunas Chish. Thank you, President Peterson. Um, I uh, really want to uh, thank you for also showing, sharing some of these um, critical uh, other impacts. The the ecosystems are a whole here uh, and the additive impacts of scrubber pollution to things that we are already facing are really significant. So we can't disassociate one of these impacts from another. Our next, speak, our next speak, speaker is uh, Vivian Yeik Mork, who is an educator and harvester of traditional foods and medicines. Vivian, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Just giving it a try. <laughs> Let's see. Did I do it? Um, you got it. Is the video on there? Let's see. I think I have it on. Am I even in there? Yep, you're there. Um, all right. Are people looking at me or you? Because I'd rather them look at you than me. <laughs> okay. Well, they're looking at your slideshow and you're probably up pinned on the right-hand side. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know if I'm in my uh, camera zone, so if I'm not, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, Big Island Hawaii too. Chinese, Hawaiian, Sami, Irish, and uh, let's link it for hello. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, um, please forgive me if there's anything that I do incorrectly today. Um, in the Tlingit language, my name is Yeh, or Cute Little Raven. In English, my name is Vivian Mork, and I'm from the Raven Moiety. I am Duck Dane Tan. I am a child of the Te Kwe Di, 
and a grandchild of the Kaguan Tan from the Snail House. And I was born and raised in Wrangell, but my Kawun lineage come in from Glacier Bay, uh, where my family has been here for a couple of ice ages. And then, of course, our um, Duck Dane Tan connections all the way up to Yakutat. So um, nice to see you in here, Cynthia. And then um, I also come from a very large multicultural family. So I'm also um, Hawaiian, Chinese, Irish, Norwegian, and um, being born and raised here in Southeast Alaska um, and teaching our language and culture and our history. Um, as I began to get older, our traditional foods and medicines were um, just became much, just very, very important to me and uh, fighting for these and teaching for our traditional foods and medicines over the years. So um, eventually I did uh, end up going to college and getting a master's degree in cross-cultural studies with an emphasis in indigenous knowledge systems and a certi certification in biologically analyzing plants. And um, part of the reason that I wanted to stress that a little bit is um, because when we're looking at assessing the impact of cruise ship scrubbers on Southeast Alaska's marine ecosystems and indigenous cultures, there's just an exceptionally limited amount of data because there's a limited amount of uh, studies that have been done. And I do, uh, I really love um, the slides uh, from the presenters before that we're talking, uh, I think it was Tom, um, who was talking about um, uh, just just the entire effects on that web of life uh, that we have uh, here in Southeast Alaska, where we've been living off of everything for thousands of years. And um, when you look at, uh, part of what he was talking about is that when you look at a lot of the studies, they're just so incomplete. Um, and when you're using uh, Western science um, to manipulate it to promote your own ideas uh, and uh, bottom dollar. That's a misuse of science in my opinion. And so it is very, very important to have, I think, uh, better studies, more studies and longer studies when it comes to uh, long-term effects of all these. And part of what he had said was that it takes a, a minimal amount of the different heavy metals and chemicals that are scrubbed to have a negative impact on the ecosystem that we have. And um, uh, could we go to the next slide, Aaron? And um, so part of what he was talking about and just, uh, you know, taking that look with that balance between Western science and indigenous knowledge. And he, I'm just going to reiterate uh, part of what he had said was that those, what sometimes Western science will look at as the bottom of the food chain things as if it um, has no impact in, on anything actually has an exceptionally large impact over our entire web of life. When you start to destroy the, um, the phytoplankton and uh, and then the things that eat the phytoplankton and then the predators of the phytoplankton, um, you, you just end up having one thing affect another, affect another, affect another. And especially with the bioaccumulation of all those different heavy metals, you know, the things that he had mentioned like nickel and um, arsenic and cadmium and all of those uh, over time. And as a, a native person, as a traditional foods and medicine educator, um, you know, I, I have to teach people that we never, ever, ever, ever harvest where the cruise ships gather. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's no way we could ever harvest their food. So literally just having a dock in town where they go um, stops us from being able to harvest there, uh, let alone um, you know, when you take a look at that entire map and where the cruise ships are going here in Southeast. So um, when we weaken any part of our food chain, it sends a ripple effect uh, throughout the rest uh, of our food chain. And um, let's just go on to the next slide because I know that we have such a limited amount of time. And so when you're looking at uh, how it affects our traditional foods directly, when uh, you have just examples here of all of the things that eat our uh, the zooplankton consumers. So you're looking at herring, you're looking at all of our juvenile salmon, uh, salmon. Um, the pteropods, all those tiny, I come from the snail house. So I have uh, a big love for uh, all the snails and all the little things in life. And so uh, if you could go on to the next slide here, 
Um, so then you have your planktivorous predators. So you have all of your um, baleen feeders and so many birds, so many of our birds are, um, I, I'm Dr. Dane Tan, so I just had to include the black-legged kittiwakes there. And then also another crest of mine is Murray birds. And so from an indigenous perspective, those are my family members. And those are birds that have literally saved our lives during times of starvation, which is how they become our crest. And um, we have to speak up for them. We have to protect them um, because we live here for thousands of years because of this intricate, diverse ecosystem that we have here. Could you go to the next slide real quick? Um, and uh, I know I'm going to uh, run out of time here real quick, so I just want to move through the slides. Um, but just that, just giving a little bit more of the details of the different creatures and uh, things that we consider family that we eat. When you're looking at all the indirect consumption of these things, all the way, uh, our seals, our sea lions, our halibut, our lingcod, our mussels, our clams, our oysters, and that is just those, and there's not very many studies ever done also on the uh, tidal plants, the tide zone plants, and uh, how all of that affects that and the bioaccumulation of, of everything there. So could you go on to the next slide real quick? Um, so when we're studying long-term effects, some of the different types of studies um, that we can use are biomonitoring programs, right? You've got your sampling of organisms from your fish and your shellfish to see how the ocean acidification is breaking down those shells. You can do your stable isotope analysis, tissue analysis, um, all of these, your, all of your sediment core sampling. But here's the thing is that once you finally prove that the cruise ship has actually affected these things to where they are a negative detriment, you are now too late because reversing these things is a lot harder than prevention, which means that the very best thing is prevention is best. It means that the time to have better fuel was years ago <laughs> um, before, before any of this started. Um, and it's it's going to leave a ripple effect for generations. And we need this diverse ecosystem to be healthy in order to live here for thousands of years more. And the world is at a time in its history when it is looking at how do we survive into the future. And they are turning now to indigenous people and indigenous knowledge that have been residing in one spot for thousands of years about how we do it. And it's time to listen. And it is would actually be also beneficial for the cruise ship themselves and their own economics and their tourism if they help us keep this area pristine. Because if there is no salmon anymore and there is no whales anymore, what are they coming to bring the visitors to? So um, there's, and then of course, um, I'm just gonna throw out that all of this, uh, all the changes that you would see over time with uh, all the different shellfish that would be affected, all the different um, kelps and seaweeds would definitely greatly impact all the other economic legs at the table besides tourism. And so I uh, just wanna leave with this, uh, this thought, our food is our way of life. And for indigenous people, as we look seven generations back and seven generations forward, what will our way of life look like in the future? We are the ancestors of the future and the choices that we make today matter. So Vivian, uh, thank you. Um, next we'll hear from Eric Jordan. Uh, Eric is a conservationist and commercial salmon troller from Sitka, Alaska. He fishes aboard his commercial salmon troller, the FV Igata. Eric, can you unmute yourself? There I you just unmuted myself. Thank you so much. And I really am humbled to follow the rest of the panelists, in particular, Vivian Mark. Um, I was also born in Wrangell, Vivian. <laughs> Hello, I'm Eric Jordan, a lifelong Southeast Alaska resident, fisherman, subsistence harvester, conservationist, and climate activist. I live and work in Sitka, Alaska on Sheik 
Kai Kwan land and waters on Clinket Ani. I am greatly honored to be included on this distinguished panel. Thank you for inviting me. In 1949, I was born two weeks, or my mother stepped off the fishing vessel I got it. I mean, off the fishing vessel Salty in August of 1949, and I was born two weeks later in Wrangell. Five months later, Marilyn and my father Skip took me back aboard and I went trolling. I have been fishing every year since and started running my own boats in 1974. You can see my hand troller on the left and my current boat named after my mother, I Gotta, is in I Gotta Go Fishing. In the early 70s, I became involved in fisheries and forest conservation and activism. I helped found or expand several fisheries and conservation groups starting in the 70s and I've worked on fisheries management, conservation, and enhancement nearly continuously since then. Some of the organizations I have been involved with or helped found include the Sitka Conservation Society and the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. I have served on numerous conservation and management boards, including the Sitka Fish and Game Advisory Committee for over 50 years now, the Alaska, or nearly 50 years now, the Alaska Board of Fisheries and Advisory Panel to the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Most recently, I helped found Transition Sitka, a climate action group. I have a long history of subsistence use and subsistence activism. I grew up eating clams, cockles, venison, and fish. We called it living off the land and sea. I've been honored to be asked to facilitate task forces to protect local subsistence foods, including halibut and sockeye salmon. And I helped write several herring conservation proposals that were adopted by the Alaska Board of Fisheries. I have learned that things that threaten subsistence foods have a disproportionate effect on poor people and indigenous and rural people. My involvements and observations have led me to great to have great concerns about air and water and marine waters pollution from cruise ships. We have a great deal to be concerned about. There are changes taking place in the waters with changes in climate and other ocean changes whose causes we do not fully understand. Some of the things I have noticed locally include Kaplan and sand lance population declines, loss of seabirds in the Sitka Sound area, and loss of clams. We don't know why the ecology and creature populations are changing, but we do know that we are facing significant new threats, including ocean acidification, ocean warming, species migration, invasion, invasion by new species, ocean survival concerns, pollution from scrubbers, gray water toxicity, and things like microplastic. As the song goes, there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. What is clear is that we should not be adding something like scrubber pollution to an already struggling ecosystem. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, uh... We appreciate your joining us today. Uh, the, our commercial fishermen out there on the grounds and waters are the people who are looking closely every day. And in the case of someone like Eric, throughout their entire life, uh, what is happening with the, uh, the fish populations, the bird populations, the migration patterns, 
the ocean temperatures, et cetera. You have to watch closely in order to be a successful commercial fisherman. Um, uh, next, we'll hear uh, uh, from, from Kay Brown with a call to action. Thank you, Aaron. As this webinar has shown, it's urgent that we stop scrubber discharges now. And President Biden is the person who can make this happen. He has the opportunity to act on this crucial issue before he leaves office in January. So if you want to do something to help, ask President Biden to clean up shipping and stop scrubber use now in the federal waters of the United States. And this slide shows two ways you can get your message to the White House. Um, there's a comment line that's open for four hours a day, Tuesday through Thursday. In Alaska, it's open from 7 to 11 a.m. There's also an online contact form. Uh, you can see there the web address as well as a QR code to access that form. And it's really important that we act now. And I also want to mention the opportunity to contact the White House through the envi its Environmental Justice Advisory Committee that Vi Wagahi serves on. And thank you, Vi, for joining us today and calling attention to this group that advises the White House on environmental quality, which is having a public meeting on October 8th and 9th. Um, so next slide. For the health of our oceans and all who depend on them, Please ask President Biden to ban scrubbers now. He has several opportunities pending to do that. And uh, simple messages, succinct messages will be helpful in encouraging him to take positive action. Back to you, Aaron. You're muted, Aaron. Looks like, oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, uh, thank you, Kay. Uh, we very much appreciate the work that Pacific Environment has been doing on uh, ocean concerns, especially scrubbers, and, and your own involvement has been particularly valuable. Um, we encourage folks to pursue those calls to action, contact the White House. Uh, we also uh, invite people to sign SEAC's petition calling for an end to scrubber pollution in Alaska. I want to emphasize, uh, and the QR code is is there on the screen. Um, you can uh, you can check our website, and I've got my email address up there too. If you'd like to contact me, I want to emphasize a couple of things. Number one is that you matter. It's the people who are paying attention, who are listening to this webinar right now or watching a recording. You are the people who matter most in this conversation. And the second thing I want to emphasize is that no is a very powerful word. And your ability to say, no, this is not acceptable, and no, this practice should not be continued, is incredibly powerful. No is a very strong word, and I encourage you to use it. And the most important place you can that that no can take place is inside here. Your own decision that this is unacceptable is the most important stewardship responsibility that you can take. And then what else can you do? Well, certainly you can sign our petition to end scrubbers and you can contact the, the White House as Kay Brown suggested. But then the most important thing to do is talk to people, use your voice. If you're a commercial fisherman, speak out, reach out to, com to your commercial fishing organizations. If you work in the travel industry, speak out. If you're a local elected representative or tribal council member, speak up. Speak to your elected officials when you see them, talk to your assembly member, tell them this is not okay. You can also draft a resolution or a letter opposing the use of scrubbers. The key things are, number one, we don't accept this, and number two, burn cleaner fuel. I encourage you to reach out to me if you'd like support and you can contact me at Aaron at SEAC.org. But keep your ears open, look for opportunities to engage on this issue and use your no. Um, I think we'll move now to a uh, uh, question and answer period. Kay, would you like to take that? Yeah, thank you, Aaron. 
Um, we have time for a few questions and we'll start with Vi's question that she put in the Q&A. What the fudge allows this to happen? And that is an excellent question, kind of a complicated situation, but I'll punt it to Jim Gamble for an explanation of how those regulatory things interact and work. Well, it is an excellent question. It's a simple question, but unfortunately it doesn't have a very simple answer. So I apologize for that. But I will say this, um, um, when we're talking about scrubbers, um, as Aaron pointed out sort of in his timeline, um, this, uh, the regulations that the state of Alaska instituted um, were designed to um, make vessels burn cleaner fuels, obviously. And, um, but there was, uh, and this is the same case in the, uh, as what happened with the International Maritime Organization some years later when they instituted the, uh, the sulfur cap, in other words, the, the ban on high sulfur fuels. Um, there was concern that there would not be enough compliant fuels uh, to keep the fleet operating. Um, uh, and, and I think at the time, it, it was a genuine concern. And um, so uh, this alternative compliance mechanism was a mechanism when it instituted. So in other words, if ships carried scrubbers and operated them while they're burning high sulfur fuel, um, that would also demonstrate compliance. Um, now at the time, I, I think most people in government thought that this would be a fairly niche application, that there wouldn't be very many vessels that would use these scrubbers, and that as soon as adequate supplies of cleaner fuels uh, were available, that they would kind of disappear. Um, what they didn't count on, though, was the fact that um, shipping companies discovered that they could save a few dollars um, over the lifetime of the ship by, in scrub, by installing these scrubber systems because of the difference in price between low sulfur fuel and high sulfur fuel. So um, ships have continued to install, and as we've seen, our growing numbers are installing them because it does uh, save them a few dollars over the lifetime of the ship. You know, and when I say a few dollars, obviously, you know, it, it's large amounts of money to you and me, but in terms of the overall uh, profits that these companies are bringing in, it's, it's literally peanuts. And so I think um, um, one thing to say is that I think that there was uh, sort of a genuine um, desire to do the right thing when these, when these uh, uh, regulations were instituted, and they didn't really count on how much greed would play uh, in the picture. So um, I would say this, um, um, this is an unfortunate situation brought about by a number of factors, as I, I just mentioned. But the solution, as we pointed out, is really simple. It's all we're asking that that operators burn cleaner fuels. And we're not talking about ultimately clean fuels at this point, zero carbon fuels, which is where we really need to get to before 2050. But what we're talking about is simply a cleaner version of heavy fuel oil, which is still quite cheap uh, compared to other cl even cleaner fuels. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that so we have a chance for more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And there are a lot of questions coming in to us now. And if we don't have time to get to them all, we will attempt to follow up with you after the webinar. But uh, let's just take a couple here, if we could. What's going on at the federal level? Um, I'll just briefly answer that. The EPA has some regulations pending under the VITA, the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act. They're going to be issuing a new set of regulations on September 23rd. If they don't do the right thing and act to regulate these now, we'll turn our attention to trying to get the federal administration to sign an executive order banning scrubbers before they leave office. And there's a link to that in the chat of where you can sign that petition. So that's a brief recap of going on what's going on now. Um, let's go to um, how can let's go to the a question from the anonymous attendee. It's my understanding there are a lot of these uh, bans or bans while in territorial waters. How can we prevent scrubber discharge in open, unregulated waters? You want to take that one, Jim? Yeah, okay. Um, and that is a good question, obviously. Um, once ships are outside of the territorial waters of the nations, um, they're in international waters, uh, essentially. And, and I would also say international waters also are the case 
for um, what are called international straits. So for example, Bering Strait, even though uh, is quite close to both Alaska and the Russian Federation, the strait itself is considered international waters because it's a international transit point between the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea. And so um, in international waters, the ruling body is the International Maritime Organization or the IMO. And, and right now the IMO is considering scrubbers. Um, there are guidelines for scrubber use that the uh, IMO is uh, involved in uh, revamping. Uh, there has been discussion about regulation or, or banning scrubber use in certain areas, but um, unfortunately the political will is sort of lacking amongst the uh, member states of the IMO. Um, what the IMO has said and the way they've responded to this, particularly in light of so many bans and restrictions on scrubbers in various locations, is that the IMO recognizes the right of countries and locales and ports to uh, regulate scrubbers uh, the way they see fit. And so I think uh, we'll see a continued process at the IMO. It might take some time, but eventually we may actually get to an international regulation. But in the meantime, there's a lot of encouragement and emphasis on local action. And as Aaron said, that's what we're talking about here today because we uh, can make a difference in the places we live. Th thanks, Kay. I think we've got time for about uh, one more. Um, what specific steps can be taken in local ports that fall outside of VITA jurisdiction? And I assume VITA covers everything in the United States. So are we talking about ports outside the United States? Somebody on the panel like to address that if possible? Hey, I, I think I'll jump in there. So the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act rules are going to be published next week. Um, these are uh, federal rules following the 2018 passage of that law, which will govern um, uh, discharges from a whole variety of sources from these large vessels. Um, unfortunately, VITA rules, once they become final, will, will severely prescribe the ability of local jurisdictions and states to uh, regulate the discharges. Uh, one of the ways that um, we see as a, as a possible option for action is simply an affirmative requirement to burn cleaner fuels. So California, for example, requires uh, that uh, the cleaner, uh, lowest sulfur um, uh, fuels be burned within 25 miles or 24 miles of the California coastline. So a cleaner fuel standard, cleaner fuel requirement is, is probably a good direction for folks. Thanks, Aaron. VITA stands for Vessel Incidental Discharge Act. It's a federal law passed a few years back. So that's what we're referring to. There are regulations pending that would implement that law. Um, I see so many good questions here. I wish we had time to address them all, but we don't. We will be following up with you after the webinar. And I want to specifically call out the uh, comment from people, commercial fishers in Ketchikan, seeing discharge, asking, what does the discharge look like? Could you briefly tell us, Aaron, what the discharge looks like? Um, so uh, the scrubber discharge that I'm, I've seen has, uh, you know, it's, it's large volumes of water. I've seen them discharge at Port in Juneau. Uh, there's uh, foam associated with it. And uh, I know that in uh, in Ketchikan, uh, they had a, a, a black sludgy foam um, from the discharge and also sheens have been spotted uh, in, in Huna and, uh, and Ketchikan and uh, previously in Juneau as well. All I right, wanna... we're going to wrap it up here and I'll turn it back to Aaron for our closing. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate the opportunity to elevate this uh, uh, serious uh, matter of concern. Uh, we encourage and invite you to take your own individual actions um, to uh, help see to it that this discharge is ended. Uh, we will be posting um, this uh, uh, webinar, the recording online, and uh, look forward to being in contact with many of you. Thank you.